let me read some of this real quick. And I'm only teaching verses 1 and 2 of Philippians chapter 1. Um, but I believe that the book of Philippians has got to be the most quotable four chapters in the Bible. I mean, four chapters that I'm going to give you proof of this in a minute. Four chapters that we have heard all the time. We rattle it off, right? Um, give you some examples. Chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is good. Somebody just shouted it out. I got a Bible reader in here. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not con- con- count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, there was somebody, every knee should bow. Um, chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, chapter 3, verse 13, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the mark. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Um, Finally, whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are commendable, Think on these things. Um, I know how to abound, and I know how to not have anything. And I'll leave you with this one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think four chapters, probably the most quotable four chapters in the Bible. Tonight, I want to teach about this whole issue of how when we are under pressure, we stay positive. Tell somebody positive under pressure. And I want us to grab a hold of what's significant about Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. What's significant about it, family, is everything I just read to you, the apostle Paul wrote while he was in a Roman prison. He didn't write this when everything was glorious and great in his life. He wrote it when the bottom had fallen out. He he wrote it while in a Roman prison. And I would argue, and this is Lord has given me permission now to have favorites. Because I believe the Philippian church was his favorite. I'm going to prove that to you as we study in the next several weeks out of Philippians. The Philippians church is one of his favorites. And Acts chapter 16 gives us insight on how the Philippian church came about. And you remember, he's in Philippi. He's there, and he conducts revival service, and a woman by the name of Lydia gets saved. Lydia begins to be the first convert in Philippi. While they're preaching in the crusade, this is Acts 16 tells us this, while they're preaching, while they're in crusade in the city, there's this slave girl calling out, calling out. He gets sick, listen to her call out, and he says, man, get clean. And this slave girl gets saved and gets delivered. Because of that, they get locked up while they are in jail. He winds up delivering the the one who has him held hostage. And not just the jailer, but Acts 16 says his whole house. This begins to be the core team. This begins to be the very first, the constituting members of the church at Philippi. What a group, what a group, right? A a former slave girl and a business owner and a jailer and his family are the constituting members of the church at Philippi. Apostle Paul is reflecting upon their journey and their walk, and he begins to send a letter to them to encourage them. He sends a letter, and in just four chapters, he lays out the significance of why we should remain positive under pressure. 
And I want to remind all of us who have Bible study this. Don't destroy your public testimony because you don't know how to act when you're going through struggle. How many of us as believers, see a lot of us, don't nobody want to hear how the Lord brought you out because while you were in, you didn't have nothing good to say about him. Teach Pastor Gallia. While you were in, you didn't have confidence that God was going to bring you through. While you were in, you didn't have, you didn't have confidence that God, that this too is going to pass. So literally while he is in captivity, he is telling them, listen, I want y'all to remain positive in what you're going through. What I want to do tonight is probably teach you two verses of Scripture that I'm going to suggest maybe you've never heard taught. All these other passages I've read, we've heard preacher after preacher, sermon after sermon. I want to preach two verses we skip right over. I want to teach two verses we skip right over. Here are the two verses. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I want to talk about tonight, just those two verses. There are some things that we learn in these verses that I want to unpack. In your note sheet, under your introduction, I want to kind of deal with the first one. And I just have one word of introduction because the problem with us quoting scriptures that are familiar to us is we usually don't think about the context they were spoken in. The problem with hyper-familiarity with certain passages of Scripture is that we just automatically think, because I'm saved and because I read it and because I memorized it, I can immediately have it. The truth of the matter is we have to understand the context that he wrote this stuff in. And I said to you at the onset that the Apostle Paul's favorite church was probably the church at Philippi which means there was something they had going for each other that oftentimes we don't have that we need as the body of Christ, which is the first point of your handout under the introduction. The first thing that I want to remind us of is that there is a relationship between fellowship and victory. A relationship between fellowship and victory. Did you, you, this is what he's saying. I can say this stuff to y'all because we've been through some stuff together. See, you, you can't have just any old body in the circle when you're going through your rough moments. Not everybody can handle, teach Pastor Gail, your, your moments of being down. And this is why, y'all, part of the reason why I'm kind of taking us back a little bit, um, for, and, and this is why even won't even be close to the same content. In 2007, I taught on the tabernacle. I've never taught on it again. And I'm teaching on it at 12 New Master Class. Here's part of the reason why. Because there are some people that came ahead of other people that had certain opportunities, heard certain things, experienced certain things. And if you were to be honest, sometimes the people we are closest to, Phil, are the ones that were with us when we were going through a rough spot. And I remember early on in ministry, you know, I didn't want us to go through tough spots in the church. And finally, God was like, no, son, you need to, you need to go through some tough spots because you don't know who's really with you when all the spots are easy. And so he, the reason Paul is able to write this at the church at Philippi it's because he is writing to people that have been with him in the trenches while he was going through. This is what I want us to grab. Don't expect that there's going to be great victory in your life if you don't know how to associate with people that know how to fight with you and hang in there with you when things are not good. Man, we, we need folk in our life. Man, I, may, who am I teaching to? 
You need some folk in your life that when you get the diagnosis, they still believe you can get healed. You need some folk in your life that when they think other folk are saying your marriage is not going to work out, you got another somebody in your life saying, girl, I'm praying with you, brother. I'm praying with you. When you lose your job, you got folk around you to say, you know what? All those times you poured lunch, I'm going to start buying lunch for a while. We need some folk that understand that there's a relationship between fellowship and victory. I think we underestimate the value of fellowship. It's not just so we can hold hands when we pray. Teach pastor. It's not just so I can have somebody to say hello to in the foyer or in the lobby. Man, I need to be with some folk that know how to see. I'm old school. Y'all, y'all, y'all pastor is from the hood. Like I'm real talk, you know, I understand the general assembly and all that stuff, church, suits, nice shoes. I grew up that you didn't hang with folk, that if something went down, they didn't have your back. You would not dare take your chance going from community to community with folk that you could not trust to be there with you when the bottom fell out. And what I want you to hear, y'all, is that we've got to start being with each other when the bottom falls out. Instead of secretly being glad you're struggling, I need to be right there with you in the midst of it, helping you get through this thing. So understand that all of the context of this is because he had relationship with people, and because of that relationship and fellowship, they shared victory together. Now, what he does in these two verses that most of us just skip over because it's just a greeting. Right? That's all we really, matter of fact, pericope of your Bible says really it's called a greeting. We don't even preach the greeting. But understand a concept that I teach the church all the time. Those of you who have been around have heard this. The Bible is not just the Word of God. It is the words of God, which means there is no word in here by accident. It's not placed by accident. And so I'm going to walk you through it now. Here's the first thing. The first thing that we need if we're going to have victory, if we're going to have this place of being positive under pressure, the first thing Paul lays out for us are the servants. Everybody say servants. The servants of victory. If you're on East City campus, jot that down. The servants of victory. This blesses me. Notice how he opens up here. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants. Now, now this, this, is, this is major. Paul does not open up with his title. He does not say, Paul the apostle. Let that sink in for a moment. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants. I'm sure immediately when the church at Philippi saw the name Paul, the slave girl immediately recognized, oh, I know that name. Right. The jailer who he was chained to thought he was going to take his life because he thought they would have escaped. I know the jailer would have said, oh, I know that name. I, I, I know, I know the, 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 the evil spirit. Y'all remember that evil spirit that the sons of Sceva tried to cast out? And the sons of Sceva tried to cast out this evil spirit. And they were like, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They would have known that name. This is where I'm going that I want us to grab a hold of, y'all. And, and the Lord, I was in my office praying about this point. Paul could have easily, the smartest personality in the New Testament, he could have said, Paul, the theologian, the guy that has planted a dozen churches by now, could have said, Paul, the church planter, the, 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 the guy that has written most of the New Testament could have said, Paul, the Bible author. He does not get into any of that. What Paul says to them is what you need to know about me is I'm a servant. Let me give you the point. The first point under the servants of victory 
is we must be known by our servanthood and not by our successes. I should be known by my servanthood and not by my successes. Let, 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 we should be known that when I say James Gellier, that name should mean something to somebody. Not pastor, not legislator, but just James Galliard. So many times, hear me, family, we hide behind our titles because our names have not been good enough to stand on their own. And nobody cares about my name if it doesn't hold weight just because I'm using my title as a way of escaping the fact that I'm not living up to who God has called me to be. Victory begins with an attitude of servanthood. This is so important for us to understand. And this is going to be this is going to be hallmark for Paul as he writes the church to the church at Philippi. That that God wants what God wants characterizing us is a meek spirit. Is a humble spirit. Is an unassuming spirit. That you know and it, and it kind of makes sense to me y'all because Think about it. If you and I were to begin lay, laying out all of our successes, do we really think God would be impressed? Even on my best day and my most successful day, the reality of it is I'm still small compared to all that God has done. And the starting point of victory in our life, the starting point of remaining positive is stop living under the pressure of a title. Stop living under the pressure of successes and say, you know what? Paul and Timothy, servants. Now, let me say a second thing about this servanthood. The second thing about this servanthood is, is defeat and discouragement are often the results of a wounded ego. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to just hang on in here with this and teach through this. Some of y'all are going to get a little bit offended. Paul is educated. Paul is eloquent. Paul is really an exalted theologian. I want you to get this. The educated Paul, the sedity Paul, the bougie Paul, watch this, would have been very uncomfortable in prison. But the servant Paul was right at home. Now, let me park here for a moment because I think oftentimes in church, what folk are upset about is that we hurt your little ego. And God wants us to recognize that we can't exalt ourselves. That when I'm feeling defeated and I'm feeling discouraged, it's because I'm operating with self. Self-interest. My, self, my selfishness. And so we have to take on an attitude of servanthood. Because think about it for a moment. If I see myself and you see yourself as a servant, if you don't get what you want, it doesn't really matter because as a servant, you will be focusing on what somebody else wanted. So, so, so the issue becomes, I wasn't thinking like a servant. And so we as believers have got to be able to operate from a perspective of thinking through stuff as a servant. Um, um, when we are self-centered, when we are self-seeking, when we are self-serving, Anyone or anything that then threatens self begins to be somebody that I'm combating with, I'm fighting with, I'm struggling with. I want to I wanna speak something over us. I want you to jot this down in your, note, your margins. I want you to, I want you to, I want to, I want to, I want to speak this over you if you'll receive it. If y'all ready for this, I want to speak this blessing that God gave Abram. In Genesis 12, I want to speak it over our church. In Genesis 12, verse number two, he says, I will make you into a great nation. 
and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will exemplify divine blessings. Or I will make your name great so you can be a blessing to others. Can I speak this over you for those of you on Rocky Mount campus, on the East City campus? Just like the Apostle Paul, my prayer for us is that God's, God would bless you with such a blessing that he would make your name so great that you don't even need your title anymore. What, what, how awesome would it be that you don't need to say you are doctor, legislator, pastor, nurse, whatever, for a door to open? All you got to do is give folk your first name. Come on, has anybody here received that? God, make my name so great. Tell your neighbor, I want God to make your name great. I want that our name ought be great. And I want you to get this, not so that we have a bunch of money, but make our name great so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. Make my name great. That's what God is speaking when he reminds us of a servant attitude of Paul. He does not have to lay out any of his accolades. All he has to do is give his name. And so this issue of being positive, this issue, jot this down, jot this down. Let me tell you what it is about making your name great. This issue about being able to use your name because you have an attitude and I have an attitude of servanthood. This is what I believe God is going to do. He's going to give you an assurance of performance. Let me unpack that. An assurance of performance. That God is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to show up so strong and so mighty in your life. I'm going to guarantee that I'm going to do the stuff I said I would do. Can you imagine what your life and my life would look like if God just showed up? And can you imagine waking up with an assurance of his performance, going to work with an assurance of his performance, showing up? Can you can you imagine what somebody's posture would be like while they're about to go under surgery, but they have an assurance of God's performance? See, the Apostle Paul is literally in a Roman prison, but the reason he can speak all of this over them is because he has an assurance that God is going to perform. That's why he says later on in the book of, of Philippians that I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. He says, I know that whatever place I found myself, I've learned how to be content because in the midst of all of this, I'm sure of this, God is going to show up. And I just feel like I need to encourage somebody with that tonight, whether it is on your job, whether it is with your marriage, whether it's with your finances. I want you to leave Bible study tonight with an assurance of God's performance. I want you to make up in your mind that God is going to show up for me, that God is going to do it for me. Come on, if you believe in your heart that God is going to show up for you and that God is going to do it, just clap your hands and tell God, thank you. God, I, I thank you for the assurance this is what Paul says, I'm in jail in Rome, but he going to show up. I'm about to be cut in surgery, but he going to show up. I don't know how the bill is going to get paid, but he going to show up. I don't know how he's going to make it all right with my child, but he's going to show up. I don't know how he's going to help me recover, but I know this. He is going to show up. And some of us, if we were to be honest, already have a shout. Not that he going to show up. <laughs> Some of us have a testimony that God has already shown up. Boy, I wish I had a handful of people that could rewind the tapes of your life and you could say, man, as I look back over my life, you know what? The reason I survived COVID is because he showed up. The reason I didn't lose my house is because he showed up. The reason I still kept my apartment is because he showed up. The reason Paul has this attitude is because he has an assurance of performance to remain positive in pressure. You have to be sure of his performance. Pastor, does that mean he will heal everybody? Of course not. Does that mean everyone will be bailed out? No, it doesn't mean that. It means God always knows best. It means that God is going to move in such a way that whatever happens to me, it's going to be good. The first thing I want us to grab a whole family is we have to have servants of victory. We've got to have a mindset of servanthood. That's where Paul starts. Paul 
and Timothy, I love this, you need some friends who are not title and power hungry. (laughs) You need some friends that don't mind being in the trenches with you. Can you see? I love sometimes just letting my, as old preachers would say, your sanctified imagination. I love just kind of letting it, you know, letting it loose every once in a while. Because I think about that thing, I'm like, Lord, can you imagine running with somebody that didn't want to keep their mouth shut? You with them. Because of what they say, you get locked up too. If it was some of us, Timothy be over there looking at Paul like, dude, I told you to be quiet, man. It's because you, we in this mess. Instead, when Paul writes, Paul says, me and Timothy, we in this together. We're in the trenches together. And when he writes to them, he says, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, look at the second thing he says. I need to have... I need to have servants of victory, but here's the second thing, to all the saints. Everybody say saints. There's got to be the saints of victory. Now, now this, this, this right here, y'all, this, let me, let me let, can I, I got to read this. I got to read this. One more time. Pay attention now. Pay attention. Wake up. Pay attention. Watch this. Watch this. To all the saints in. Everybody say in. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at, everybody say at, at Philippi. And this is powerful if we grab it. This is what I call in at theology. To all of the saints in Christ who are at Philippi. Now, this is important because if it were us, we might say to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi. But he doesn't do that because one is a statement of geography and one is a statement of spirituality. And what he's saying is it doesn't really matter what your geography is if your spirituality is the right thing. So he says, he says, so so this is important because, because even though he is in jail, he's really at jail. Okay, okay. We rewind it. In jail would mean I am bound by it. At jail means it's just my location. But what I am is really in Jesus. So you can be at the emergency room, but in Jesus. You can be at the funeral, but in Jesus. You could be at court, but in Jesus. One is a statement of my spirituality, and one is a statement of my geography. Now, let me unpack this for a moment, y'all. Hoo-hoo. See, that's the reason why some of y'all, you, gotta be, you can always tell the folk who, who are... In who are who are in church and not in Christ. <laughs> see, because because see, when you in Christ, you know it's you not as hard to please. In Christ, I come clapping. In Christ, I come ready. In Christ, so we have to recognize that just because this is powerful, we get it. Just because my geography has limitation does not mean I'm subject to the limitation of my geography. My limitation is determined by my spirituality. Have you ever had a situation where other folk losing sleep, can't hardly eat, and you eating and snoring? And you wondering how in the world? I'm going to show you in a minute how you get there. And this is the reason. Because we need to function as saints. Now, I know some of you are like, all right, pastor, if you knew my weekly activity, I don't think you'd be calling me a saint. Well, if you are saved, God does. If we are saved, God sees us as saints. Notice what he says here. 
He says very clearly, y'all, to all the saints in Christ who are at Philippi. Now, let me just tell you why this matters. It matters, and this is the next point in your handout. It matters because I need to see myself and see others as to who we really are in Jesus. I should not see you apart from who you are in Jesus. See, we would treat each other different if we recognize that my brother or my sister who is saved in the eyes of God are a saint. Oh, boy. That means we would stop defining people by their mistakes. It means we would stop identifying people by their sin. Oh, boy, it's tough in here now, but that's all right. It means that we would function and we would treat each other different because we would see each other as saints. And let me go deeper. Even if you struggle seeing other folk as a saint, you better learn to see yourself the way Jesus sees you. I think this is one of the most powerful things we can do as believers is stop seeing ourselves the way other people see us and instead recognize how fearfully and wonderfully made we are and how God sees you in his own image. So let me tell you what it means. To see myself and others as we really are in Jesus means seeing ourselves as holy, seeing ourselves as righteous, seeing ourselves as set apart, seeing ourselves as a child of God, seeing ourselves as a child of the King, seeing ourselves as a joint heir with Christ, seeing ourselves in Jesus Christ as, okay, let me give it to you. Let me say it like this. Seeing ourselves as forgiven. Seeing ourselves as righteous. Seeing ourselves as holy. Y'all, 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 y'all. Whether we want to believe it or not or see it, Jesus, when you received him, made you a saint. He says to the saint, let me tell you why. Can I, can I just, let me try to make it live. Um, I'm, my, my dad, my dad um, raised us to take great pride in our name. As a matter of fact, my brother and I both, we use our whole name. You know, I use my middle name. You know, I was f- funny when Stephanie was introducing me or mentioning she called my whole name, James David. Let me tell you, when I was growing up, my dad would say to me, G is for God, G is for great, G is for Gailyard. And he would look at me and he would say, act like your name. Let me tell you why this matters. If I would see myself as a saint, there's a greater likelihood I'll start talking like one. It, come on, y'all not hearing me, y'all. Come on, y'all. If, if you would see yourself like a saint, you dress like one. Oh, boy, I'm, I'm way out the gate on this one right now. Come on, the next time you get dressed, ask yourself, would a saint dress like this? Would a saint show this much flesh? Uh Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Come on. The next time I talk to you, would a saint talk like that? Oh, boy. I wish I knew what East City Campus is doing because they're not showing me love right here right now, Rocky Mount. You think about our behavior is almost always because we don't see ourselves as we really are. Would a saint really cheat on his wife? If, if we brothers and sisters in Christ, would you really treat that sister like that if you saw her as the saint she is? Can, can, can I go? I'm, y'all, you know what? I ain't scared of y'all. I'm just going to go for it. When a man disrespects a woman, whether by the way he hollers at her, talks to her, makes some kind of advance, makes some kind of statement, I ain't scared of y'all, I'm going to say it. It's for one of two reasons. 
it's either because he sees her that way or, be, or because he thinks she sees her that way. That's the only reason. I've yet to see a brother step up to a nun with all her stuff on, trying to holler and be disrespectful. Because he recognized, because just because of how she has adorned herself, he doesn't see her like that. And he suspects because she looks like that, she don't see herself like that. When you're about to jump somebody and beat them up, it's because you either see them as somebody you can beat or you think they see themselves as somebody who can be beat. The way we treat each other, oh boy. See, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not going to move on because y'all know me. If y'all this quiet, I know we need it. And so we have to recognize that we are saints. Tell, tell somebody near you, you are a saint. You are a saint. You, type that in online. You are a saint. And we have to treat one another that way. That's where the victory comes from. Saints don't do the things some of us do. So he says to the saints that are at Philippi, I want you to know who you are in Jesus. Whew. In Jesus, you don't have to live and not be married to get your bills paid. It, Okay. Not in Jesus. In Jesus, you don't have to scheme your way to the top. In Jesus, you don't have to make other people look bad so you can look good. In Jesus, you don't have to take shortcuts. He says, start acting like who you are. All that is right in the greeting. Paul and Timothy, servants, because in order to have victory, we need servant attitudes. To the saints that are at Philippi, to the saints that are in Jesus who are at Philippi. Do you know the value of this for our young people? They're on the other side of the building learning. I'm a saint. I'm in Jesus. I mean, this is, you know, I tell people all the time, being in the General Assembly is just another, it's a mission for me. It's just a ministry. Because I'm, whenever I'm at the General Assembly, I'm always in Jesus. So it doesn't really matter what I expose myself to. I recognize that my location, I feel like I had to minister this. My location is subject to my spirituality. Oh, God. So see, when you let folk pull you down because that's where they are, the issue is not where you are. It is not your geography. It is your spirituality. Oh, boy. So that means I can go to work and be a witness. Because I might work at the city, but I'm in Jesus there. Okay, so I'm on the campus, but I'm not doing what everybody else on the campus is doing. Because even though I'm at the campus, I'm in Jesus. That's what he's talking about when he says saints. I need y'all to see yourself for who you are. Jot this down in your notes somewhere, and I want you to put it in your mirror. It's your, you know, I know some of y'all like to write on the mirror with lipstick or put a sticky note on the mirror or whatever. Remind yourself daily that I'm better than this. It, I, when you're about to do what other folk do, I'm better than that. See, this is why you don't have to treat folk how they treat you because you're better than that. This is why I don't have to talk about you because you're talking about me because you're better than that. To the saints, let me change it around. Let me change it around. Let me change it around. Change. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Word Tabernacle. Where are my saints in Christ Jesus at Word Tabernacle? That's what I want to know. Come on, online. Who, where are my saints in Christ Jesus at Word Tabernacle? Because you can always tell the saints at word tabernacle, not in Christ Jesus. So, if there's going to be positivity in my pressure, servanthood, the servant of victory. 
the saint of victory. Number three. Third thing it teaches us, who is it going to get tight? Is the structure of victory. Amen, Pastor. The structure of victory. Pastor, where is that in the text? To all the saints who are in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, now watch the structure with the overseers and deacons. He specifies that there are some folk at the church that are with overseers and deacons. Now, this is going to be worth the price of admission if you can live it. Here's the piece that I want you to see. In order to get victory in our life, we have to be willing. This is in marriage, careers, finances, raising children, it, you name it. In order to have victory, structure is necessary. So let me say something about the structure of victory. One of the keys to living a victorious life one of the keys to living a, a prosperous life, one of the keys to doing all of that is learning to live under God's structures of authority. And I knew that's like teaching about money right there. Folk just quiet. Man, if I had an amen in the room for people that recognize that in every environment that God puts you in, he puts a structure there. And if I bypass that structure, it sets me up for failure. And then we don't like to talk about this. So what he does is, is that he starts laying out some foundational work around the structure. He specifically says, overseers, Specifically talks about some Bibles, it talks about pastors and bishops. Let me say something about this. God will not bless a church, and I mean even an individual in the church. He will not bless a church who rebels against his authority. Three amens in the room. Four online. Um, first, first Samuel Chapter 15 talks about to resent authority is like the sin of rebellion, and it compares rebellion to witchcraft. I, now, I know that's hard for us, but you really think this is why young people need to understand the, some, the importance of submission to authority. All the adults should have been saying amen to that. Because, because when your child or my child rebels against us, they are operating in witchcraft. How God going to bless that? When we operate against people that God has put in authority over us at work, at school, in government, in church, in ministry, in schools, how can God bless it? What Paul lays out here to the church at Philippi is he reminds them of the structure that they have been given. And, and so I want us to unpack this for a minute because I think there are two elements of this, two elements of, of, of this structure. The first element of this structure is supervision. Everybody say supervision. It, he says to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the, over, with the overseers. That's that. In some Bibles, it says pastors, right? So the overseers, these are people that have supervisory responsibility. They're literally guarding stuff. They, they are literally, um, some Bibles say bishops. Um, they are overseers. This is a, they are guardians. Um, th th we have to have people, and this, this is so tough, good Lord, Y'all, everybody can't be in charge. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Gallia. It's just, you know, somebody has to oversee. Come on, say amen if you can. It just, I mean, 
And so we have to recognize that we have a struggle in getting victory and remaining positive. And this, I don't know who this is for, but if you are rebelling against anyone that God has given you over, that has given oversight over you, then you are setting yourself up to not have the victory that he wants you to have. And let me tell you something, man. Life is too short to go to work every day working for somebody you can't stand, can't respect, can't talk to. Life is too short to be involved in a ministry and you just resenting the fact that they're in charge and you're not. And y'all, the quicker we learn how to submit to God-given structure and authority, the better off we all are. Amen, Pastor. So he says, first of all, to the saints, but then to the overseers who are the bishops, it really in the Greek describes the office of pastor. I, I'm not going to, y'all not going to make me fight that. So I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, I'll save that for another Bible study. And so, so what, what I'll say to you is that in the Greek, pastor, bishop, overseer, same word. Okay, same word. It's just responsibility over the flock. It's just supervision over something, okay? And I think, I think sometimes, okay, I'm going to go for it a little bit. I think sometimes we can get so caught up in the weightiness of the title that we think it exempts us from having close contact and, and, and interaction with those we've been called to supervise. It, I can't supervise you if I'm never around you. Mm. It, it, if, if, if I'm never seeing what's going on at the church, in the ministry. So the first element of the structure, and y'all, it's a good word for parents. You can't oversee a house you never come home to. Amen, pastor. Come on, you can't oversee children you're never around. And what I want you to grab is in order to remain positive, in order to have this joy, in order to have this victory, in order to have this assurance of performance that Paul is talking about, we have to be willing to submit ourselves to something. So the first is supervision. But then the second word I want you to jot down is servanthood. It's servanthood. Because he says, overseers and deacons. And now I'm not picking that fight either. <laughs> But deacons were always meant scripturally to be servants. They weren't meant to run nothing. He says, I'm not trying to pick no fights with nobody about any beliefs in any church, okay? I'm not trying to do that. My task is to teach the Bible. And when you look at how deacons even came about, it's because somebody needs to serve somebody, right? So how all of a sudden they wound up with committees is not how, the God, not how God set it up. Okay. You, you, they were set in order place to run for the church, not to run the church. <laughs> so Paul says there's got to be a structure I'm sorry. I'm, I, I really, it's, it's not funny, but it's funny. Because it's like, how do you, like, if I really understand that the servant is at one place and the overseer is someone else, then there is no chair of the deacons. Because the chair of the deacons would be the overseer who's the pastor or the bishop. Oh, but okay, that's a whole nother Bible study. Just, I... So why does this matter? The reason this matters, family, is because God wants us to learn how to submit to the structures he puts us in. And when we learn how to submit to those structures, he has established such that we will gain victory when we do that. But when I rebel against it, I'm setting myself up for failure. So now let me say something that I want us to grab a hold of because you have you got the church in general, 
you have the overseers or you have those who are supervising, and then you have the servants, right? And so let me say something that I hope will be worth you coming to Bible study for. When we spend our time doing the things someone else can do, then we fail at the things no one else can do. It, now, some of us won't, won't say amen to this because maybe it's coming from me, right? But and can, can y'all handle my transparency? Can y'all handle that? I, don't, I know some of y'all are new and y'all don't, not, not used to being around pastor who just put his business in the street. But I feel like if I do, keep somebody else from doing it, right? So, um, so I haven't been preaching as well lately, in my opinion. And, and, and part of that is because our schedule got pushed up, right? So because of the bad weather, um, I have to record, or I was recording on Thursdays. But Fridays and Saturdays are my sermon memorization days. So I get done writing on Thursday. I start memorizing on Friday. When I was looking at myself online the last two weeks, I noticed I was reading more than I ever usually read. And the reason I was reading more than I usually read is because I lost my two memorization days. Are y'all following me? Now, now, let me tell you why this matters. Such is the case. A lot of times we will be critical of whether it's the pastor or the person playing or the person singing or the person serving in ministry or the person in leadership. And one of the things that we fail to realize is maybe they have gotten so bogged down in doing what someone else should have done that the thing they should have been focusing on, they couldn't. And, you know, like I, I mean, this is no, and, and y'all are really new, and, and, and so let me just share some of this. And I'm almost done. I always teach till about 8 o'clock. Um, I don't use the term adjutant. I don't use the term um, armor bearer. You know, we have you know, men who are pastoral support and women who are pastoral support. A lot of times people don't really get that, right, kind of what that's about. Um, but they really, they help me a lot, right? So, like, they'll make sure my truck is gassed up or they'll make sure it's, you know, whatever I need done. Like, they, hey, you know, they get it done for me so that, I can focus on what I need to focus on. It's not a statement of I don't know how to gas up my own truck. It's not about that. It's about the fact that I could get a lot of people to gas up the truck, but I can't get a lot of people to write my sermon. And I'm, I'm going somewhere with our discussion questions that I want you to grab a hold of, y'all. The reason this issue of structure is important is so that we can each identify where we fit in so that we can do the stuff that we need to do for the kingdom so the other people that have roles in the kingdom can be freed up to do the stuff that nobody else can do in the kingdom. If that makes sense, come on, say that makes sense, Pastor. So I want you to, and, and, so, and so, so let me give you the last, let me give you the last statement here. The last statement I want you to jot down is the sequence of victory. The C, actually I have two statements, but I'm gonna make them quick. The sequence of victory. Now, I'm about to teach you something you may not have seen before in the scriptures. All the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, that structure. Now, this is not something we talk a lot about. Grace to you and peace from God. Everybody say grace and peace. That is the sequence of victory. In the scriptures, some of y'all are going to pull your stuff out. In the Greek, never once in the New Testament is it peace and grace. Never once. It is always grace and peace. That is the sequence of victory. It's always grace first and then peace. And, and, and so we have to operate in this space of grace. It all starts with grace. Come on, somebody say it all starts with grace. Y'all, it all starts with grace. Have, all right, y'all. Y'all, let, let me poll the room real quick. 
Is there anybody here in Rocky Mount or East City Campus that God has ever solved a problem for you? Come on, somebody say that's grace. Come on, God, has God ever kept a promise to you? Come on, that's grace. Has God ever comforted any pain you've ever been in? That, that's grace. Has God guarded you? Has God, sa- has, any, has God saved anybody in this room, anybody online? If God has saved you, that's grace. If God has ever answered a prayer, that's grace. If God has ever guided you along the way, that's grace. If God has ever pers- helped you persevere, that is grace. Okay, y'all still don't get it. Let me help you understand what grace is. You would say, Pastor, I already know. It's God's unmerited favor. It's more than that. It is his unmerited favor. Yeah, it's his kindness. And it's his unmerited favor. I'm going to shout if you don't. His unmerited favor that is shown to someone who doesn't deserve it. You know, yeah, 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 that ain't even the shouting part yet. Let me give you the shouting part. His unmerited favor, his unmerited kindness that is shown to people that don't deserve it and instead deserve the opposite. Now, how many of us can look back over our life and say, man, God did some stuff for me, but the truth be told, I deserve the opposite. He gave me peace, but I deserve the opposite. He opened the door, but I deserve the opposite. We've got to recognize that it all begins with grace. And y'all hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. If you have grace, peace is coming. See, this is why folk can't keep you from sleeping good at night. Folk can't take your appetite away because the moment you have the grace of God, you automatically have peace. And so it manifests itself in forgiveness, in acceptance, in presence, in enablement, in freedom, in completion. That is the source. That is the sequence of victory. Grace always precedes peace. And here's the last thing and we're done. He says, let me give you the source of the victory I have. This is why all I've taught you is these two greetings, these two verses of greetings of why Paul is saying I can be positive under pressure. The last reason I can be positive under pressure, Paul says, he says, because I've got the sequence of my victory, grace and peace from God. Watch this. From God, our Father and the Lord Jesus He says, I can remain positive because finally, finally, here's the last thing, because of the source of my victory. (laughs) Woo, boy. Everybody say, it's from God. Come on, can I help somebody real quick? When folk look at what has happened in your life and they wonder how in the world, where did you get that? It's from God. (laughs) Where did you get that sweet attitude? It's from God. Where did you get that healing? That's from God. Come on, does anybody have a it's from God testimony that when you look over your life and see where God has brought you, the testimony of it is it's from God. So what Paul is saying is that the source of my victory is God. And because God is the source of my victory, I can be positive under pressure. Say amen if you can. This week in your discussion, I want to ask you three questions. Number one, what things are you doing that someone else could do? Mm. Amen. Let that sink in for a moment. Number two, what things are someone else doing that you should be doing? Wow. And then finally, I want you to, in your family, in your discussion, talk about the authority structures in your life. What areas of your life are lacking such structures? Think about that this week. And I want us, as church members, as word members, as people that are in Christ Jesus at Word Tabernacle to be positive under our pressure. Say amen if you can. 
Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.